The Book of Ruth. Chapter 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malan and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malan and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. At this they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried." May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth, the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Chapter 2 Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man of standing whose name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabitess, said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they called back. Boaz asked the foreman of his harvesters, Whose young woman is that? The foreman replied, She is the Moabitess who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She went into the field and has worked steadily from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. I have told the men not to touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She exclaimed, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I have been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have given me comfort, 
and have spoken kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servant girls. At mealtime Boaz said to her, Come over here, have some bread, and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men, Even if she gathers among the sheaves, don't embarrass her. Rather, pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up, and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, Where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, That man is our close relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabitess said, He even said to me, Stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It will be good for you, my daughter, to go with his girls, because in someone else's field you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the servant girls of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Chapter 3 One day Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for? Is not Boaz, with whose servant girls you have been, a kinsman of ours? Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man, and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. "'Who are you?' he asked. "'I am your servant Ruth,' she said. "'Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are our kinsman redeemer.' "'The Lord bless you, my daughter,' he replied. "'This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier.' You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am near of kin, there is a kinsman redeemer nearer than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to redeem, good, let him redeem. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning." So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, Don't let it be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, Bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and put it on her. Then he went back to town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, How did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her, and added, He gave me these six measures of barley, saying, Don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, Wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Chapter 4 Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat there. When the kinsman redeemer he had mentioned came along, Boaz said, Come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, Sit here. And they did so. Then he said to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the land from Naomi and from Ruth the Moabitess, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this the kinsman redeemer said, 
then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, Buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilian, and Malin. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabitess, Malin's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from the town records. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and all those at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. Then he went to her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This, then, is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashan, Nashan the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. This book is concluded. The First Book of Samuel Chapter 1 There was a certain man from Ramathaim, a Zephite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah, and the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion, because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow, saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk, and said to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. 
Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah lay with Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. When the man Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, After the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, Elkanah, her husband, told her. Stay here until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, As surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. Chapter 2 Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly, or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows, and by him deeds are weighed. The bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumbled are armed with strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry hunger no more. She who was barren has borne seven children, but she who has had many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. Upon them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked will be silenced in darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder against them from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, but the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest. Eli's sons were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord. That was the practice of the priests with the people that whenever anyone offered a sacrifice, and while the meat was being boiled, the servant of the priest would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand. He would plunge it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot and the priest would take for himself whatever the fork brought up. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned, the servant of the priest would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give the priest some meat to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. If the man said to him, Let the fat be burned up first, and then take whatever you want, the servant would then answer, No, hand it over now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. This sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. Each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go home. And the Lord was gracious to Hannah. She conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. 
Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Now Eli, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So he said to them, Why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, it is not a good report that I hear spreading among the Lord's people. If a man sins against another man, God may mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with men. Now a man of God came to Eli and said to him, This is what the Lord says. Did I not clearly reveal myself to your father's house when they were in Egypt under Pharaoh? I chose your father out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar to burn incense and to wear an ephod in my presence. I also gave your father's house all the offerings made with fire by the Israelites. Why do you scorn my sacrifice and offering that I prescribe for my dwelling? Why do you honor your sons more than me by fattening yourselves on the choice parts of every offering made by my people Israel? Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promise that your house and your father's house would minister before me forever. But now the Lord declares, Far be it from me. Those who honor me I will honor, but those who despise me will be disdained. The time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your family line, and you will see distress in my dwelling. Although good will be done to Israel, in your family line there will never be an old man. Every one of you that I do not cut off from my altar will be spared only to blind your eyes with tears, and to grieve your heart, and all your descendants will die in the prime of life. And what happens to your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, will be a sign to you. They will both die on the same day. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish his house, and he will minister before my anointed one always. Then everyone left in your family line will come and bow down before him for a piece of silver and a crust of bread and plead, Appoint me to some priestly office so I can have food to eat. Chapter 3 the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel a third time, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears of it tingle. At that time I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons made themselves contemptible, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning, and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision, 
But Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, Here I am. What was it he said to you? Eli asked. Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. Chapter 4 And Samuel's word came to all Israel. Now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel, and as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring defeat upon us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Shiloh, so that it may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. So the people sent men to Shiloh, and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came into the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, What's all this shouting in the Hebrew camp? When they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. A god has come into the camp, they said. We're in trouble. Nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us! Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the desert. Be strong, Philistines. Be men, or you will be subject to the Hebrews, as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and the Israelites were defeated, and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The Ark of God was captured, and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. That same day a Benjamite ran from the battle line and went to Shiloh, his clothes torn and dust on his head. When he arrived, there was Eli sitting on his chair by the side of the road, watching, because his heart feared for the Ark of God. When the man entered the town and told what had happened, the whole town sent up a cry. Eli heard the outcry and asked, What is the meaning of this uproar? The man hurried over to Eli, who was ninety-eight years old, and whose eyes were set so that he could not see. He told Eli, I have just come from the battle line. I fled from it this very day. Eli asked, What happened, my son? The man who brought the news replied, Israel fled before the Philistines, and the army has suffered heavy losses. Also your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the Ark of God has been captured. When he mentioned the Ark of God, Eli fell backward off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was broken, and he died, for he was an old man and heavy. He had led Israel forty years. His daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and near the time of delivery. When she heard the news that the Ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she went into labor and gave birth, but was overcome by her labor pains. As she was dying, the women attending her said, Don't despair, you have given birth to a son. But she did not respond or pay any attention. She named the boy Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel, because of the capture of the Ark of God and the deaths of her father-in-law and her husband. She said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the Ark of God has been captured. Chapter 5 after the Philistines had captured the Ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then they carried the Ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon, fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. But the following morning when they rose, there was Dagon, fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. 
His head and hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. That is why to this day neither the priests of Dagon nor any others who enter Dagon's temple at Ashdod step on the threshold. The Lord's hand was heavy upon the people of Ashdod and its vicinity. He brought devastation upon them and afflicted them with tumors. When the men of Ashdod saw what was happening, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not stay here with us, because his hand is heavy upon us and upon Dagon our God. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and asked them, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, Have the ark of the God of Israel moved to Gath? So they moved the ark of the God of Israel. But after they had moved it, the Lord's hand was against that city, throwing it into a great panic. He afflicted the people of the city, both young and old, with an outbreak of tumors. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. As the ark of God was entering Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They have brought the ark of the God of Israel around to us to kill us and our people. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and said, Send the ark of the God of Israel away. Let it go back to its own place, or it will kill us and our people. For death had filled the city with panic. God's hand was very heavy upon it. Those who did not die were afflicted with tumors, and the outcry of the city went up to heaven. Chapter 6 When the ark of the Lord had been in Philistine territory seven months, the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners and said, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we should send it back to its place. They answered, If you return the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it away empty, but by all means send a guilt offering to him. Then you will be healed, and you will know why his hand has not been lifted from you. The Philistines asked, What guilt offering should we send to him? They replied, Five gold tumors and five gold rats, according to the number of the Philistine rulers, because the same plague has struck both you and your rulers. Make models of the tumors and of the rats that are destroying the country, and pay honor to Israel's God. Perhaps he will lift his hand from you and your gods and your land. Why do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh did? When he treated them harshly, did they not send the Israelites out so they could go on their way? Now then, get a new cart ready with two cows that have calved and have never been yoked. Hitch the cows to the cart, but take their calves away and pen them up. Take the ark of the Lord and put it on the cart, and in a chest beside it put the gold objects you are sending back to him as a guilt offering. Send it on its way, but keep watching it. If it goes up to its own territory, toward Beth Shemesh, then the Lord has brought this great disaster on us. But if it does not, then we will know that it was not his hand that struck us, and that it happened to us by chance. So they did this. They took two such cows, and hitched them to the cart and penned up their calves. They placed the ark of the Lord on the cart, and along with it the chest containing the gold rats and the models of the tumors. Then the cows went straight up toward Beth Shemesh, keeping on the road and lowing all the way. They did not turn to the right or to the left. The rulers of the Philistines followed them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were harvesting their wheat in the valley, and when they looked up and saw the ark, they rejoiced at the sight. The cart came to the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh, and there it stopped beside a large rock. The people chopped up the wood of the cart and sacrificed the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites took down the Ark of the Lord, together with the chest containing the gold objects, and placed them on the large rock. On that day the people of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices to the Lord. The five rulers of the Philistines saw all this, and then returned that same day to Ekron. These are the gold tumors the Philistines sent as a guilt offering to the Lord, one each for Ashdod, Geza, Ashkelon, Gath, and Ekron. And the number of the gold rats was according to the number of Philistine towns belonging to the five rulers, the fortified towns with their country villages. The large rock on which they set the ark of the Lord is a witness to this day in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. But God struck down some of the men of Beth Shemesh, putting seventy of them to death because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. The people mourned because of the heavy blow the Lord had dealt them, and the men of Beth Shemesh asked, Who can stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? To whom will the ark go up from here? Then they sent messengers to the people of Kiriath-Jerim, 
saying, The Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up to your place. Chapter 7 So the men of Kiriath-Jerim came and took up the ark of the Lord. They took it to Abinadab's house on the hill and consecrated Eleazar his son to guard the ark of the Lord. It was a long time, twenty years in all, that the ark remained at Kiriath-Jerim, and all the people of Israel mourned and sought after the Lord. And Samuel said to the whole house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths, and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their Baals and Ashtoreths, and served the Lord only. Then Samuel said, Assemble all Israel at Mizpah, and I will intercede with the Lord for you. When they had assembled at Mizpah, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day they fasted, and there they confessed, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel was leader of Israel at Mizpah. When the Philistines heard that Israel had assembled at Mizpah, the rulers of the Philistines came up to attack them. And when the Israelites heard of it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. They said to Samuel, Do not stop crying out to the Lord our God for us, that he may rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. Then Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it up as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, and the Lord answered him. While Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to engage Israel in battle. But that day the Lord thundered with loud thunder against the Philistines, and threw them into such a panic that they were routed before the Israelites. The men of Israel rushed out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to a point below beth -car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far has the Lord helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not invade Israelite territory again. Throughout Samuel's lifetime, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines. The towns from Ekron to Gath that the Philistines had captured from Israel were restored to her, and Israel delivered the neighboring territory from the power of the Philistines. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Samuel continued as judge over Israel all the days of his life. From year to year he went on a circuit from Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah, judging Israel in all those places. But he always went back to Ramah, where his home was. And there he also judged Israel. And he built an altar there to the Lord. Chapter 8 When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges for Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, and accepted bribes, and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together, and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know what the king who will reign over them will do. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, This is what the king who will reign over you will do. He will take your sons, and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands, and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your men servants and maid servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. 
When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, and the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations, with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, Listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the men of Israel, Everyone go back to his town. Chapter 9 There was a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekorath, the son of Aphiah of Benjamin. He had a son named Saul, an impressive young man without equal among the Israelites, a head taller than any of the others. Now the donkeys belonging to Saul's father Kish were lost, and Kish said to his son Saul, Take one of the servants with you, and go and look for the donkeys. So he passed through the hill country of Ephraim, and through the area around Shalisha, but they did not find them. They went on into the district of Shalem, but the donkeys were not there. Then he passed through the territory of Benjamin, but they did not find them. When they reached the district of Zuf, Saul said to the servant who was with him, Come, let's go back, or my father will stop thinking about the donkeys and start worrying about us. But the servant replied, Look, in this town there is a man of God. He is highly respected, and everything he says comes true. Let's go there now. Perhaps he will tell us what way to take. Saul said to his servant, If we go, what can we give the man? The food in our sacks is gone. We have no gift to take to the man of God. What do we have? The servant answered him again, Look, he said, I have a quarter of a shekel of silver. I will give it to the man of God so that he will tell us what way to take. Formerly in Israel, if a man went to inquire of God, he would say, Come, let us go to the seer, because the prophet of today used to be called a seer. Good, Saul said to his servant, Come, let's go. So they set out for the town where the man of God was. As they were going up the hill to the town, they met some girls coming out to draw water, and they asked them, Is the seer here? He is, they answered. He's ahead of you. Hurry now. He has just come to our town today, for the people have a sacrifice at the high place. As soon as you enter the town, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. The people will not begin eating until he comes, because he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Go up now. You should find him about this time. They went up to the town, and as they were entering it, there was Samuel coming toward them on his way up to the high place. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel. About this time tomorrow I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him leader over my people Israel. He will deliver my people from the hand of the Philistines. I have looked upon my people, for their cry has reached me. When Samuel caught sight of Saul, the Lord said to him, This is the man I spoke to you about. He will govern my people. Saul approached Samuel in the gateway and asked, Would you please tell me where the seer's house is? I am the seer, Samuel replied. Go up ahead of me to the high place, for today you are to eat with me, and in the morning I will let you go and will tell you all that is in your heart. As for the donkeys you lost three days ago, do not worry about them. They have been found. And to whom is all the desire of Israel turned, if not to you and all your father's family? Saul answered, But am I not a Benjamite, from the smallest tribe of Israel? And is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such a thing to me? This book is continued on the other side of this tape. 1 Samuel, chapter 9, verse 22. Then Samuel brought Saul and his servant into the hall, and seated them at the head of those who were invited, about thirty in number. Samuel said to the cook, Bring the piece of meat I gave you, the one I told you to lay aside. So the cook took up the leg with what was on it and set it in front of Saul. Samuel said, Here is what has been kept for you. Eat, because it was set aside for you for this occasion, from the time I said, I have invited guests. And Saul dined with Samuel that day. After they came down from the high place to the town, Samuel talked with Saul on the roof of his house. They rose about daybreak, And Samuel called to Saul on the roof, Get ready, and I will send you on your way. When Saul got ready, 
he and Samuel went outside together. As they were going down to the edge of the town, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to go on ahead of us. And the servant did so. But you stay here a while, so that I may give you a message from God. Chapter 10 Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him, saying, Has not the Lord anointed you leader over his inheritance? When you leave me today, you will meet two men near Rachel's tomb at Zelza on the border of Benjamin. They will say to you, The donkeys you set out to look for have been found. And now your father has stopped thinking about them and is worried about you. He is asking, What shall I do about my son? Then you will go on from there until you reach the great tree of Tabor. Three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you there. One will be carrying three young goats, another three loaves of bread, and another a skin of wine. They will greet you and offer you two loaves of bread, which you will accept from them. After that you will go to Gibeah of God, where there is a Philistine outpost. As you approach the town, you will meet a procession of prophets coming down from the high place with lyres, tambourines, flutes, and harps being played before them, and they will be prophesying. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you in power, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Go down ahead of me to Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, but you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart, and all these signs were fulfilled that day. When they arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came upon him in power, and he joined in their prophesying. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, What is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? A man who lived there answered, And who is their father? So it became a saying, Is Saul also among the prophets? After Saul stopped prophesying, he went to the high place. Now Saul's uncle asked him and his servant, Where have you been? Looking for the donkeys, he said. But when we saw they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. Saul's uncle said, Tell me what Samuel said to you. Saul replied, He assured us that the donkeys had been found. But he did not tell his uncle what Samuel had said about the kingship. Samuel summoned the people of Israel to the Lord at Mizpah and said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought Israel up out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But you have now rejected your God, who saves you out of all your calamities and distresses. And you have said, No, set a king over us. So now present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and clans. When Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. Then he brought forward the tribe of Benjamin, clan by clan, and Matri's clan was chosen. Finally Saul, son of Kish, was chosen. But when they looked for him, he was not to be found. So they inquired further of the Lord, Has the man come here yet? And the Lord said, Yes, he has hidden himself among the baggage. They ran and brought him out. And as he stood among the people, he was a head taller than any of the others. Samuel said to all the people, Do you see the man the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people. Then the people shouted, Long live the king! Samuel explained to the people the regulations of the kingship. He wrote them down on a scroll and deposited it before the Lord. Then Samuel dismissed the people, each to his own home. Saul also went to his home in Gibeah, accompanied by valiant men whose hearts God had touched. But some troublemakers said, How can this fellow save us? They despised him and brought him no gifts. But Saul kept silent. Chapter 11 Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to him, Make a treaty with us, and we will be subject to you. But Nahash the Ammonite replied, I will make a treaty with you, only on the condition that I gouge out the right eye of every one of you, and so bring disgrace on all Israel. The elders of Jabesh said to him, Give us seven days, so we can send messengers throughout Israel. If no one comes to rescue us, we will surrender to you. When the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul, and reported these terms to the people, they all wept aloud. 
Just then Saul was returning from the fields, behind his oxen, and he asked, What is wrong with the people? Why are they weeping? Then they repeated to him what the men of Jabesh had said. When Saul heard their words, the Spirit of God came upon him in power, and he burned with anger. He took a pair of oxen, cut them into pieces, and sent the pieces by messengers throughout Israel, proclaiming, This is what will be done to the oxen of anyone who does not follow Saul and Samuel. Then the terror of the Lord fell on the people, and they turned out as one man. When Saul mustered them at Bezek, the men of Israel numbered three hundred thousand, and the men of Judah thirty thousand. They told the messengers who had come, Say to the men of Jabesh-Gilead, By the time the sun is hot tomorrow, you will be delivered. When the messengers went and reported this to the men of Jabesh, they were elated. They said to the Ammonites, Tomorrow we will surrender to you, and you can do to us whatever seems good to you. The next day Saul separated his men into three divisions. During the last watch of the night, they broke into the camp of the Ammonites and slaughtered them until the heat of the day. Those who survived were scattered, so that no two of them were left together. The people then said to Samuel, Who was it that asked, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring these men to us, and we will put them to death. But Saul said, No one shall be put to death today, for this day the Lord has rescued Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal, and there reaffirm the kingship. So all the people went to Gilgal and confirmed Saul as king in the presence of the Lord. There they sacrificed fellowship offerings before the Lord, and Saul and all the Israelites held a great celebration. Chapter 12 Samuel said to all Israel, I have listened to everything you said to me and have set a king over you. Now you have a king as your leader. As for me, I am old and gray, and my sons are here with you. I have been your leader from my youth until this day. Here I stand. Testify against me in the presence of the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? From whose hand have I accepted a bribe to make me shut my eyes? If I have done any of these, I will make it right. You have not cheated or oppressed us, they replied. You have not taken anything from anyone's hand. Samuel said to them, the Lord is witness against you, and also his anointed is witness this day, that you have not found anything in my hand. He is witness, they said. Then Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron, and brought your forefathers up out of Egypt. Now then, stand here, because I am going to confront you with evidence before the Lord as to all the righteous acts performed by the Lord for you and your fathers. After Jacob entered Egypt, they cried to the Lord for help. And the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your forefathers out of Egypt and settled them in this place. But they forgot the Lord their God, so he sold them into the hand of Sisera, the commander of the army of Hazor, and into the hands of the Philistines and the king of Moab, who fought against them. They cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned, we have forsaken the Lord, and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths. But now deliver us from the hands of our enemies, and we will serve you. Then the Lord sent Jerob Baal, Barak, Jephthah and Samuel, and he delivered you from the hands of your enemies on every side, so that you lived securely. But when you saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, was moving against you, you said to me, No, we want a king to rule over us, even though the Lord your God was your king. Now here is the king you have chosen, the one you asked for. See, the Lord has set a king over you. If you fear the Lord and serve and obey him and do not rebel against his commands, and if both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord your God, good. But if you do not obey the Lord, and if you rebel against his commands, his hand will be against you as it was against your fathers. Now then, stand still and see this great thing the Lord is about to do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest now? I will call upon the Lord to send thunder and rain, and you will realize what an evil thing you did in the eyes of the Lord when you asked for a king. Then Samuel called upon the Lord, and that same day the Lord sent thunder and rain. So all the people stood in awe of the Lord and of Samuel. The people all said to Samuel, Pray to the Lord your God for your servants, so that we will not die, for we have added to all our other sins the evil of asking for a king. Do not be afraid, Samuel replied. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn away from the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. 
Do not turn away after useless idols. They can do you no good, nor can they rescue you, because they are useless. For the sake of his great name the Lord will not reject his people, because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. And I will teach you the way that is good and right. But be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. Yet if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will be swept away. Chapter 13 Saul was thirty years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel forty-two years. Saul chose three thousand men from Israel. Two thousand were with him at Michmash, and in the hill country of Bethel, and a thousand were with Jonathan at Gibeah in Benjamin. The rest of the men he sent back to their homes. Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost at Geba, and the Philistines heard about it. Then Saul had the trumpet blown throughout the land and said, Let the Hebrews hear. So all Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost, and now Israel has become a stench to the Philistines. And the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. The Philistines assembled to fight Israel with three thousand chariots, six thousand charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash, east of beth -Avon. When the men of Israel saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, they hid in caves and thickets, among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, When I saw that the men were scattering, and that you did not come at the set time, and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You acted foolishly, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and appointed him leader of his people, because you have not kept the Lord's command. Then Samuel left Gilgal and went up to Gibeah in Benjamin, and Saul counted the men who were with him. They numbered about six hundred. Saul and his son Jonathan and the men with them were staying in Gibeah in Benjamin, while the Philistines camped at Michmash. Raiding parties went out from the Philistine camp in three detachments. One turned toward Ophrah in the vicinity of Shul, another toward Beth Horon, and the third toward the borderland overlooking the valley of Zeboam facing the desert. Not a blacksmith could be found in the whole land of Israel, because the Philistines had said, Otherwise the Hebrews will make swords or spears. So all Israel went down to the Philistines to have their plowshares, mattocks, axes, and sickles sharpened. The price was two-thirds of a shekel for sharpening plowshares and mattocks, and a third of a shekel for sharpening forks and axes, and for repointing goads. So on the day of the battle, not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan had a sword or spear in his hand. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had them. Now a detachment of Philistines had gone out to the pass at Michmash. Chapter 14 One day Jonathan, son of Saul, said to the young man bearing his armor, Come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migron. With him were about six hundred men, among whom was Ahijah, who was wearing an ephod. He was the son of Ichabod's brother Ahitub, son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. No one was aware that Jonathan had left. On each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One was called Bozes, and the other Seni. One cliff stood to the north toward Michmash, the other to the south toward Geba. Jonathan said to his young armor-bearer, Come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised fellows. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. 
Do all that you have in mind, his armor-bearer said. Go ahead, I am with you heart and soul. Jonathan said, Come then, we will cross over toward the men and let them see us. If they say to us, Wait there until we come to you, we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, Come up to us, we will climb up, because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. So both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of the holes they were hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor-bearer, Come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armor-bearer, Climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Jonathan climbed up, using his hands and feet with his armor-bearer right behind him. The Philistines fell before Jonathan, and his armor-bearer followed and killed behind him. In that first attack, Jonathan and his armor-bearer killed some twenty men in an area of about half an acre. Then panic struck the whole army, those in the camp and field, and those in the outposts and raiding parties, and the ground shook. It was a panic sent by God. Saul's lookouts at Gibeah of Benjamin saw the army melting away in all directions. Then Saul said to the men who were with him, Muster the forces and see who has left us. When they did, it was Jonathan and his armor-bearer who were not there. Saul said to Ahijah, Bring the ark of God. At that time it was with the Israelites. While Saul was talking to the priest, the tumult in the Philistine camp increased more and more. So Saul said to the priest, Withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all his men assembled and went to the battle. They found the Philistines in total confusion, striking each other with their swords. Those Hebrews who had previously been with the Philistines and had gone up with them to their camp went over to the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. When all the Israelites who had hidden in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were on the run, they joined the battle in hot pursuit. So the Lord rescued Israel that day, and the battle moved on beyond beth -Avon. Now the men of Israel were in distress that day, because Saul had bound the people under an oath, saying, Cursed be any man who eats food before evening comes, before I have avenged myself on my enemies. So none of the troops tasted food. The entire army entered the woods, and there was honey on the ground. When they went into the woods, they saw the honey oozing out, yet no one put his hand to his mouth, because they feared the oath. But Jonathan had not heard that his father had bound the people with the oath, so he reached out the end of the staff that was in his hand, and dipped it into the honeycomb. He raised his hand to his mouth, and his eyes brightened. Then one of the soldiers told him, Your father bound the army under a strict oath, saying, Cursed be any man who eats food today. That is why the men are faint. Jonathan said, My father has made trouble for the country. See how my eyes brightened when I tasted a little of this honey. How much better it would have been if the men had eaten today some of the plunder they took from their enemies. Would not the slaughter of the Philistines have been even greater? That day, after the Israelites had struck down the Philistines from Michmash to Ajalon, they were exhausted. They pounced on the plunder and, taking sheep, cattle, and calves, they butchered them on the ground and ate them together with the blood. Then someone said to Saul, Look, the men are sinning against the Lord by eating meat that has blood in it. You have broken faith, he said. Roll a large stone over here at once. Then he said, Go out among the men and tell them, Each of you bring me your cattle and sheep, and slaughter them here and eat them. Do not sin against the Lord by eating meat with blood still in it. So everyone brought his ox that night and slaughtered it there. Then Saul built an altar to the Lord. It was the first time he had done this. Saul said, Let us go down after the Philistines by night and plunder them till dawn and let us not leave one of them alive. Do whatever seems best to you, they replied. But the priest said, Let us inquire of God here. So Saul asked God, Shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you give them into Israel's hand? But God did not answer him that day. Saul therefore said, Come here, all you who are leaders of the army, and let us find out what sin has been committed today. As surely as the Lord who rescues Israel lives, even if it lies with my son Jonathan, he must die. But not one of the men said a word. Saul then said to all the Israelites, You stand over there. I and Jonathan my son will stand over here. Do what seems best to you, the men replied. Then Saul prayed to the Lord, the God of Israel, Give me the right answer. 
and Jonathan and Saul were taken by lot, and the men were cleared. Saul said, Cast the lot between me and Jonathan, my son. And Jonathan was taken. Then Saul said to Jonathan, Tell me what you have done. So Jonathan told him, I merely tasted a little honey with the end of my staff, and now must I die? Saul said, May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if you do not die, Jonathan. But the men said to Saul, Should Jonathan die, he who has brought about this great deliverance in Israel? Never, as surely as the Lord lives, not a hair of his head will fall to the ground, for he did this today with God's help. So the men rescued Jonathan, and he was not put to death. Then Saul stopped pursuing the Philistines, and they withdrew to their own land. After Saul had assumed rule over Israel, he fought against their enemies on every side, Moab, the Ammonites, Edom, the kings of Zobah, and the Philistines. Wherever he turned, he inflicted punishment on them. He fought valiantly and defeated the Amalekites, delivering Israel from the hands of those who had plundered them. Saul's sons were Jonathan, Ishvi, and Malchishua. The name of his older daughter was Merab, and that of the younger was Michael. His wife's name was Ahinoam, daughter of Ahimaaz. The name of the commander of Saul's army was Abner, son of Ner, and Ner was Saul's uncle. Saul's father Kish and Abner's father Ner were sons of Abiel. All the days of Saul there was bitter war with the Philistines, and whenever Saul saw a mighty or brave man, he took him into his service. Chapter 15 Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go, attack the Amalekites, and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. So Saul summoned the men and mustered them at Telaim, two hundred thousand foot soldiers and ten thousand men from Judah. Saul went to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the ravine. Then he said to the Kenites, Go away, leave the Amalekites, so that I do not destroy you along with them. For you showed kindness to all the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur, to the east of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak they totally destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, I am grieved that I have made Saul king, because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was troubled, and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Early in the morning Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone on down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, What then is this bleating of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. Stop, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, Although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission, saying, Go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Make war on them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. 
For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the people, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe, and it tore. Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today, and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. Saul replied, I have sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me, so that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel went back with Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. Then Samuel said, Bring me Agag, king of the Amalekites. Agag came to him confidently, thinking, Surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so will your mother be childless among women. And Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgal. Then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him. And the Lord was grieved that he had made Saul king over Israel. Chapter 16 The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he is tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent and had him brought in. He was ruddy, with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then went to Ramah. Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul's attendants said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the harp. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes upon you, and you will feel better. So Saul said to his attendants, Find someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the harp. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a young goat, and sent them with his son David to Saul. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armor-bearers. 
Then Saul sent word to Jesse, saying, Allow David to remain in my service, for I am pleased with him. Whenever the Spirit from God came upon Saul, David would take his harp and play. Then relief would come to Saul, he would feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. Chapter 17 Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war, and assembled at Soko in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Damim, between Soko and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled, and camped in the valley of Elah, and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill, and the Israelites another, with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing five thousand shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed six hundred shekels. His shield-bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time he was old and well advanced in years. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For forty days the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Now Jesse said to his son David, Take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are, and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning David left the flock with the shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and greeted his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, This is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter, and the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, You are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy, and he has been a fighting man from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. 
Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand approached the Philistine. Meanwhile the Philistine, with his shield-bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog, that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the scabbard. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Shearaim road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem, and he put the Philistines' weapons in his own tent. As Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistine, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is that young man? Abner replied, As surely as you live, O king, I don't know. The king said, Find out whose son this young man is. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul, with David still holding the Philistine's head. Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked him. David said, I am the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem. Chapter 18 After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his father's house. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic, and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Whatever Saul sent him to do, David did it so successfully that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the people, and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with tambourines and lutes. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain galled him. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully upon Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the harp, as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Saul was afraid of David, because the Lord was with David, but had left Saul. So he sent David away from him, and gave him command over a thousand men, and David led the troops in their campaigns. In everything he did, he had great success, because the Lord was with him. When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, because he led them in their campaigns. Saul said to David, Here is my older daughter, Merab. I will give her to you in marriage. Only serve me bravely and fight the battles of the Lord. For Saul said to himself, I will not raise a hand against him. Let the Philistines do that. 
But David said to Saul, Who am I, and what is my family or my father's clan in Israel, that I should become the king's son-in-law? So when the time came for Merab, Saul's daughter, to be given to David, she was given in marriage to Adriel of Mahola. Now Saul's daughter Michael was in love with David, and when they told Saul about it, he was pleased. I will give her to him, he thought, so that she may be a snare to him, and so that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. So Saul said to David, Now you have a second opportunity to become my son-in-law. Then Saul ordered his attendants, Speak to David privately, and say, Look, the king is pleased with you, and his attendants all like you. Now become his son-in-law. They repeated these words to David. But David said, Do you think it is a small matter to become the king's son-in-law? I'm only a poor man and little known. When Saul's servants told him what David had said, Saul replied, Say to David, The king wants no other price for the bride than a hundred Philistine foreskins to take revenge on his enemies. Saul's plan was to have David fall by the hands of the Philistines. When the attendants told David these things, he was pleased to become the king's son-in-law. So before the allotted time elapsed, David and his men went out and killed two hundred Philistines. He brought their foreskins and presented the full number to the king so that he might become the king's son-in-law. Then Saul gave him his daughter Michael in marriage. When Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter Michael loved David, Saul became still more afraid of him, and he remained his enemy the rest of his days. The Philistine commanders continued to go out to battle, and as often as they did, David met with more success than the rest of Saul's officers, and his name became well known. Chapter 19 Saul told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan was very fond of David, and warned him, My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. I'll speak to him about you, and will tell you what I find out. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul his father, and said to him, Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you, and what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all Israel, and you saw it and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? Saul listened to Jonathan and took this oath. As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. So Jonathan called David and told him the whole conversation. He brought him to Saul, and David was with Saul as before. Once more war broke out, and David went out and fought the Philistines. He struck them with such force that they fled before him. This book is continued on the next tape.